Welcome to the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast, where we equipped you to more effectively lead your seat at any employer, business, or industry in which you choose to play. Each week, we help you sharpen your leadership acumen by cracking open the playbooks of dynamic leaders who are doing big things in their professional endeavors. And now your host, leadership tactics and organizational development expert, Karen Farrell-Rhodes. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone, and thanks for joining in another episode designed to help you better lead at the top of your game. As you know, for season three, each month we're featuring leaders who have interesting roles in a particular profession or industry. Today's episode is part of our special series featuring leaders navigating the digital world. We're thrilled to have on today's show, Manisha Dewan, founder and CEO of Empath Coaching, a firm which helps develop people-centric skills for high-performing teams. She is also the author of The Digital Agile Leader, where she shares stories and strategies on how to navigate change in the workplace and beyond. Manisha shares how working with her father in the family business kickstarted her love for business and leadership and eventually led to a career pivot from corporate America to now consulting leaders on how to best attract, develop, and retain top talent in an ever-changing digital world. Be sure to listen to her tips and perspectives to gain insights on how to further your leadership acumen. And now, enjoy the show. Hey there, superstars. This is Karen, and welcome to another episode of the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast. I am so pleased to have an exciting episode for you today. Um, Another expert on leadership, but with a different lens. And so we are so honored to have on today's show. Manisha Dewan. Um, Manisha is the founder and CEO of Empath Coaching, which is a firm that helps leaders at all levels enhance people-centric skills and create more engaged, inclusive, and productive teams. She's also the author of The Digital Agile Leader, where she shares stories and strategies on how to navigate change in the workplace and beyond. So welcome to the podcast, Manisha. Thank you, Karen. I'm excited to be here. Oh, we are just honored and thrilled to have you. I cannot wait to delve into learning a little bit more about your company and your book. And I know there's a ton of things that we can talk about. I was joking with you before that we probably could be on the podcast for four hours if they let us, but they won't. (laughs) But what we'll do, though, is Uh, Let's start out with sharing with the audience just a little bit about you personally. So just for as much as you feel comfortable, would you give us a sneak peek into maybe some of your personal life and or passions? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, four hours would be great if we had that much time. Even with my, let's see, my background, I'll try to keep that concise as well. But I'm really, really fortunate to have grown up in a household where I learned a ton starting at a young age and was exposed to business at a very early age. Born in Canada, but we moved to San Diego and my parents immigrated from India. My dad started a business out of our garage when I was just a toddler and I'll never forget just running around following him in the garage and I thought we were in the middle of a a big game and just, you know, playing around, but he was actually creating something and building something from the ground up. Uh, And I, I learned from him, just watching him um, evolve and expand the business over time. Uh, He started off with like seminars and then he moved into like products and then building systems for for water purification. So that was a big lasting impact on my life. And I learned a lot of work ethic from that. I live in San Diego currently. I'm really close to my family. I love building community, just being involved with even like college students and developing skills at an early age and giving that guidance and mentorship to people. Oh, that sounds amazing. And it, your dad sounds amazing. And yeah, he he sounded, have- um, <laughs> very influential. And I'm sure there's, you could probably write a whole book on, you know, some of the things you, you learned from him, but can you tell us a little bit more? Can we go one click down and, and share a little bit about what you observed of someone you know, building a business from the ground and seeing it grow and progress. 
Yeah, I'm going to be honest, Karen. It wasn't easy. I mean, we were not in a great financial position. My mom's a full-time homemaker yeah. and was raising a bunch of kids. Well, there's four of us now. So, and my dad was trying to make ends meet. He was really passionate about a technology. He really believed in it, but in the corporate setting, I think like many of us face, he didn't necessarily have the leeway to be an entrepreneur, to chase his passions, to innovate. So he decided to go off on his own. By trade, he's a PhD in chemical engineering. So he had a good, strong foundational education. And when he started his business, it, it again started by maybe giving consulting services to then expanding into different products. And he actually was one of the pioneers in the water treatment industry. So at a very you know, um, early stage and when the industry was just booming, he saw an opportunity, he capitalized on it. But then as time changed, he tried to evolve and, and shift the direction of the business based on consumer demands in the marketplace. And what I learned from him, because it was interesting, I actually had, I worked with him throughout high school summers when my friends were off, you know, having fun and going to the beach. My parents were like, nope, you got to go work in the family business. And sure. at the time I was really kind of annoyed, but looking back, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful. Like that was actually an opportunity and good training grounds for me to really understand ins and outs of how a business is run. And no job is too big or small when you're in a family business. So everything right. from packing boxes to shipping, to printing labels, to doing administrative work, to then going to like trade shows. I remember going traveling with my dad and we would go and set up a booth at a conference and go meet with clients and, and potential vendors. And this is again, as at an early age, I was in high school. So I learned a lot about how to be resilient and persistent in the face of loss too. You know, if things didn't work out and we maybe didn't get what we expected, but then also how to pivot and be really highly adaptable, which set me up for future careers once I pivoted after that. That is amazing. And the reason why I wanted to have you share that a little bit is because people don't realize it's a true struggle. Well, some do, if, if those that are entrepreneurs and are trying to build a business, but there are ups and downs. I mean, the highs are highs, but the lows can be lows. And it's a, you know, it affects family, friends, and your whole environment. And it says a lot when you're able to make it through and be resilient around that. And those are, to your point, that some of the lessons learned that you can carry out throughout life. And I noticed also that you started your education in one field and did a pivot as well. Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah. So initially I thought, you know, working for my father, the company's applied membranes in San Diego. And I thought, you know, maybe I should get a science background too. And I completed a chemistry undergrad degree, which was also very challenging, but sometimes I believe it's worth challenging ourselves and taking a difficult road. And I didn't, you know, fly with passing grades or get like straight A's <laughs> or anything like that, but I learned a ton on, and I learned how to think like a scientist. And I talk a lot about that process of deconstructing problems and trying to figure out what problem are we trying, are, are we solving? What's our hypothesis? How do we test it? How do we get insights? So that foundation of education really was core to developing a mindset of just, you know, hypothesizing, experimenting and learning. But after a while, I realized I don't really want to be in the lab. And I think as a chemist, you know, there was a few <laughs> options. I could go down a research path or go down teaching. But I really started to fall in love with the people side and, and engaging and interacting with people. And my heart was drawn back into like the business side of it versus going deep into chemistry, which to be honest with you, wasn't necessarily my strongest skill anyway. So after college, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And if it were up to me, I would have stayed in college longer <laughs> and been a forever student. But my family, again, my rock, you know came to my side and said, hey, you've got to make some decisions here. Why don't you come back and work in the family business until you figure out you know, if there's some other things that you're interested in? And so I did. And I worked in the family business for about six years after graduating college. But this time in a different capacity than when I was in high school. I really got into marketing and finance and operations and the business was growing more. And after those six years, I said, you know, I'm craving the education piece again. So I went back to school at UC Irvine and got my MBA. Oh, that is wonderful. And did you work in the workforce first or did you jump right into starting an empath? 
No, you, you're right. I did. I worked for many years before starting. Empath came about just, there was always something in the back of my mind. Like maybe I want to have something of my own. My father's an entrepreneur, but I pushed it to the side and I, I just started to take opportunities that came my way. So in, in my MBA program, I did an internship at PwC and that's my first exposure to like big management consulting firms with global clients and really, you know, um, high stakes projects, high visibility initiatives. And I took a full-time offer upon graduation at, actually at Deloitte Consulting and spent about six years there. Yeah. Now, but that was a learning experience. That was a learning experience. <laughs> and, and that was kind of a boot camp of sorts. I thought, I thought I had it all figured out. I knew business. I grew up in an entrepreneurial household. I, but no, I had so much more to learn. It really humbled me. <laughs> and I had a lot to learn about myself and my leadership style and working with like global cross-functional teams with very different perspectives and trying to make uh, things come together as seamlessly as possible. And so when you started Empath, where, what did you decide you wanted to, to focus on? And then where are you now with the business? Yeah, great question. So in my time at Deloitte, actually, then I, I, I made more career pivots. I think there's, it's the consultant in me that's always itching to, to learn and grow. So I ended up moving to another consulting firm called Slalom. And then I spent about five years at Taco Bell headquarters. And then I spent another year in a staffing and recruiting firm. And looking back, it's like, why am I making all these career pivots? Well, different reasons. With my father's business, it was more just to see what else I could do. Ironically, come full circle, I'm, I'm back helping in the family business. <laughs> um, but with Deloitte and the Taco Bells, I mean, there was points in my career where I felt stagnant or I felt like there was more I could do, but there were some limitations or barriers or hurdles. It was really challenging in my consulting career. And sometimes you have to decide, do I want to continue this lifestyle? At the time, I was traveling every single week on a plane, Mondays and Thursdays, and didn't really have much of a personal life. My weekends were pretty just shot. You know, I was just doing laundry and packing and repeating. Uh, mm -hmm. Taco Bell, it was a really great experience doing some really innovative, cool projects. But after a while, you know, it started to feel more of like something else was pulling me. And I think that was the business that I started. I started to get clues along the way that I can only connect the dots looking back. And there were some common themes looking back that led me to create my business. One is, I think in general, this need for people to feel like they're supported and seen and heard and valued in the workplace. And for whatever reason, people weren't coming to me for that advice. How do I deal with challenges with my boss? How do I ask? for a promotion? How do I present to this executive team on this, on this topic? And I would just talk to them, you know, just I'd be a sounding board. And until one day somebody said, have you thought about being a coach? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. What does that entail? Well, I was actually a career coach in my MBA program. I'm doing a lot of like resume and interview preps for my classmates, but I never really thought of it as a career until going through my own challenges in the workplace, dealing with not so great leadership, feeling like I was, I don't know, being minimized or pushed aside or undervalued. Like I had to go through so many challenges to really appreciate the need for better leadership, for more cohesive teams. A lot of times I would be called in to turn a stagnant project around, a project that was like failing that nobody wanted to really take on because there were just too many challenges. And then they threw it in my way. And I realized the way I turned it around was actually through the people. By pulling out what matters to them, what their strengths are, how they want to contribute, how that ladders up to the common goal, how we can disagree, but also align and move forward. And it was something that I just uncovered through all the projects I was on and decided why not, if there's a demand for it, maybe it's something I could actually make into a business. Amazing. And so now how long have you been in business now? Oh, it's been three and a half years. Ah, and you Water. survived to tell the story. Look at that. Congratulations. <laughs> I decided to quit my job in the middle of the pandemic, which may not be the best move and nothing I would advise people to do. I always think it's good to have a fallback option and maybe build something on the side. But I took a bold move and I had um, enough savings to kind of, and ironically, I actually landed my first client the week I quit my last job. And I did my last job because I'll never forget my boss was just yelling at me for 20 minutes on a call. I had to put the phone down and I said, enough is enough. I have to get out. And I want to, I think I can make a better impact from the outside versus inside. And 
congratulations to you because sometimes you, we don't listen to our inner gut or the inner angel that is talking to us. Um, when you know when enough's enough and you have the courage to be able to take that leap, which is a scary leap, I'm sure, but there are greener pastures, it seems to be, you know, down the road. So very happy and proud that you did that and that it worked out for you. <laughs> Thank you. And in, in hindsight, I also think that experience with the last boss I had was actually just the push I needed and maybe not quite the angel speaking to me. Oh, really? <laughs> Somebody else telling me, hey, the gremlin no. was pushing you. Yeah, like it's time to go. And uh, uh, I hear you. What I need. Well, let's um, pivot towards your book. We want to learn a lot more about that. It's called the Digital Agile Leader, which is such a unique name. Can you share um, a little bit about the genesis of the book? And we'd love for you to share at least a tip or two to leave with our audience. Absolutely. Yeah. So I always kind of had in the back of my mind, maybe I'll write a book someday, but you know, I think we all deal with imposter phenomenon or the comparison trap where we're like, well, who am I to be an author? Or what do I have to say? Is anyone going to even read it? There's so right. many books out there. Until I just started writing and saying, well, I mean, it is my voice and these are my stories and only we have those for ourselves. Right. So That's right. My book started out with just like a word vomit of here's everything I'm purging and living with and dealing with and processing. And I started to find uncover themes. I really wanted to give a guidebook and a tool for other people that are learning how to navigate change, whether it's changing their careers like I did, changing something in their personal life, navigating or leading change in the workplace. So that's one of the common themes, as well as how can you be a better leader, especially during times of change. And I just reflected on key moments and, and stories in my life that really shaped who I am. And there's a tool that I use in the book called the Agility Matrix. And the genesis of that is, it's kind of a funny story. My brother is 13 years younger than me. And as a joke, he used to call me Moose when we were growing up. <laughs> Affectionately, I'm sure, right? <laughs> things within the family, I don't want to right. become a trend. But he joked and said, I'm only going to read your book if you put a moose in the book. And I said, okay, so I'm accepted. It. How am I going to do this now? But I realized, you know, I actually went and researched the moose and I kind of resonated with it. So... This tool helps us understand and identify and recognize how are we showing up in the face of change through the lens of different animals? Are we, for example, there's the ostrich, which you can probably guess is someone that puts their head in the sand, wants to ignore and avoid the change that's happening, even though it's around them, maybe they're not ready to face it. And by the way, it's not bad. It's not a bad thing to be an ostrich. Maybe you want to conserve your energy and protect yourself and you're just simply not ready. Right. But are you aware of that? Is it helping you? Is it holding you back? Do you want to maybe tap into the coyote, which is another animal I talk about? The coyote is embraces change. They are maybe a little bit more bold and daring and they lead the way. So when have you felt that in your life? It's very situational. So this is a tool that I think I want people to just take home with them. And there's also an assessment that comes with it. Just to take a step back and say, is it helping me or hurting me? How am I serving others? Are there people on the team that might be getting left behind that I need to support or provide access to resources? Uh, do I need to pause and ask some more thoughtful questions before just leaping into change? And uh, so, yeah. And then another tool I would say is just really more guiding questions that I pose throughout the book, self-reflection. You know, for example, thinking about your purpose or your meaning. Can you derive that from your current role? I know a lot of people feel frustrated and just want to maybe change jobs, but I believe also in trying to make the most of where you are and reflect on how, what are you doing or what could you be doing to make it a better experience because the grass is not always greener and I've learned that. So yeah, I think I'm hoping that this book really can resonate with anyone that's going through change, even if you're not necessarily have the title or role of a leader in an organization, you're a leader in your own life. Gotcha. So it's kind of sharpening that. I see the the agility ability. No, I didn't mean to rhyme, but it did. To adjust, pivot, and be able to handle 
major change, I guess, in your work and life. Is that kind of absolutely yeah. I love I mean, the it. digital component of it? You're right. I mean, I do talk a little bit about you know how our world is changing rapidly, and and oh I was God. leading a lot of global, large scale digital transformations at, at companies and. A lot of it encompasses change management, but also being thoughtful. You know, are we just following the latest trend and slapping on new technology because we think it could buy us some great marketing exposure? Or does it really, is it meaningful in the context of our business? How is it going to impact the people and the processes? So for example, we've, we're all hearing a lot about AI and generative AI and, you know, any, any sort of emerging tech so a lot of these technologies have been around for a long time, but continue oh, yeah. to evolve, right? And become more yeah. immersive. Before we know it, we won't even know if we're using it. It's so embedded in our lives. But businesses and, and even individuals, we kind of have a res- responsibility to take a step back and say, are we, are we doing this in a way that's, that's ethical, that's aligned with our values? Again, does it make sense for our organization? And why are we doing it? What are we automating and why? What do we not want to automate because that's just as important as knowing what to automate. So this digital agility of, okay, things are changing fast, but I need to just be open and curious and learn and then ask these questions to see how will it apply rather than just leaping forward. That makes so much sense. I'm, I'm curious, in your opinion, what is one big miss that or pitfall or obstacle that people find themselves in because they were not either conscious or skilled or agile enough? Yeah, I think it's kind of the saying, you know, we've always done it this way, so we're going to keep doing it this way. Why change what's working? You know, why do we have to change anything? And I write about this particular story in my book, which is a true story. One of my clients she was very, very scared of change. And it's natural. Like we're wired to resist change. We may view change as a threat. We don't know what change brings. There's a lot of unknowns. So when we were doing a whole transformation in the organization, she was scared it was going to impact her job and her role. And she learned that from past experience that she was actually let go because her job was made redundant by technology or by processes that were eliminated. Um, So it's really important to then meet people where they are and help them upskill or reskill. She, in her case, she actually took her shoe off and threw it against the wall in a meeting. Was, oh my gosh, really? Yeah, I've never <laughs> seen anything like that in my life. And <sighs> the whole, there was like 30 people in the room. We were all just working on our laptops. She got so frustrated at the system, but I think, you know, she, ultimately she was expressed, she was most frustrated with herself. She didn't feel like she was understanding this tool. She was struggling to learn it. And then she just started cursing and saying, why are we even doing this? I don't like this. I'm not bought in. A natural visceral reaction, maybe throwing a shoe is not very natural, but (laughs) it was a reaction in the moment. Luckily, no one got injured. I had to put my team, pull my team aside, make sure they were okay. You know, we had to get HR involved. It was a big thing, but ultimately she ended up staying on the project. We had to talk to her about it. And I just recognized she needed more support and training and reassurance that her job was not going to be eliminated. And here's how her job was changing. It was being, you know, redefined, but we still viewed her and valued her as, as a integral part of the team. And, and at the end of the project, she ended up being one of our biggest champions and supporters, which was really wild to see after it took about two years. Well, the, wow. She came a long way from the shoe throwing to being a valued team member. That's <laughs> right. Oh, right. I, I think it's important we don't lose hope in each other. And <laughs> we're all in a different journey of change. Some people are, you know, yeah, on resistance mode, but then they might come around or they might stay where they are. But we have to decide what to do. You, to you're so right. And so, you know, based on that story, that example, I'm not sure if that's the reason why you chose this, but it makes a lot of sense if it's one of the reasons. But um, as you know, I wrote a book on leadership execution, and we always ask our guests, you know, which of the top seven tactics that I write about uh, really resonated with you. And you mentioned uh, leading with stakeholder savvy, uh, which for my newer audience members, leading with stakeholder savvy. You know, it's kind of the sister tactic to have an into emotional intelligence. It's all about, you know, really um, understanding the people that you're interacting with to what Manisha says, meeting them halfway 
and um, being effective in a variety of professional social situations. And uh, it's all about kind of being understanding and meeting people where they are and understanding what they're trying to, what they're talking about, what their priorities are and building deeper relationships. So I'm just curious in your words, Manisha, why do you think leading with stakeholder savvy is really important or why did it resonate with you? Wow. And by the way, I love all your principles. So it was really hard for me to select one, but (laughs) this one spoke to me on so many levels. And by the way, this is something also that I had to develop and hone over time. I don't think I was the savviest person in the workplace until I figured out this kind of unlock that you mentioned, this EQ piece, this empathy piece, but also being decisive when you need to. So we can have empathy for others, extend that compassion, take action and support them, but ultimately say, you know, this is direct the direction we're going in. So we need you to be on board or not. I mean, ultimately leaders do have to make these decisions. But in general, I think for me, all the projects I've been on, all my experiences, all the leaders I've worked with, that's one trait I really admire is are they savvy enough to read the room, to understand the different personalities and the dynamics that are at play? If somebody feels, you know, reading their verbal or nonverbal cues, which can be hard to distinguish because they don't translate across cultures and across different people, right? We, we might misread these signals. It could look, it could seem That's like right. someone's upset, but maybe they just have a stomach ache. I don't know. You know? Yeah. So, but being able to sense the energy in the room and then check in and ask people, you know, how are you feeling about this? And what are some of your thoughts? Anything that we've missed? Opening up the channels for feedback. I think makes you even even savvier, can give you more information to make better decisions. When I was first told to take over this big project, because my boss actually had a stroke on the project. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Which yeah. was, that just tells you how stressful the, the work environment was. Yeah. I rejected, I declined it at first because I didn't want to take on such a big burden. But it was kind of like, this is, we need you to do this. Can you just step up for for the team just for a few months? And I had to really roll up my sleeves and figure out how to work with different personalities. For one thing, I was now managing a friend of mine. Oh, that's a challenge. I know. (laughs) From personal experience. Right? Yeah. I have a good heart to heart with her. Let her know that, you know, while our roles might be changing, I'm still there to support her. But initially there was some adjustment on both sides. But then I had to deal with, I had to learn how to deal with someone that was, that didn't want to see me in that role and was trying to thwart my efforts and sabotage. And so I had to navigate around that. And the way I found that was most helpful was to build alliances and relationships with other people and not necessarily fight or take on certain battles. So that what you're speaking of is emotional intelligence combined, I think, with just st- strategy and being strategic, building r- relationships all the time, not just when you meet them, like building that social equity and that social capital across the enterprise. Some of my biggest supporters and biggest helpers were people in unexpected places. It could be the executive admin who had tons of sites and know-how. It's not always the C-suite that you need to be you know, connecting with. And being authentic and genuine, I think people will open up to you and will, will want you to be successful for the most part. I totally agree. I totally agree with that. And, you know, for me, I've always been passionate about great leadership. So it energizes, the topic has always energized me ever since I was young. But it can be exhausting sometimes and challenging, especially during times of high work or high stress, such as the times that you've mentioned, both in consulting, in your consulting gigs and at other employers. And I'm just curious, what does it take for you to lead at the top of your game? What do you try to do to to bring that that energy and that, that keeps you centered and helping that helps you to be the best that you can be? Such a great question. And you're right. There's a lot of exhaustion. There's burnout. It can be very challenging if we're not taking care of ourselves. And I've been guilty of that too, where I end up overworking myself or getting caught up in something. Mm-hmm. Um, overthinking something. So I have to take a step back and have some reality checks with myself. I think number one, super important is to have a support system around you. And these are not just people that will agree with you and say yes all the time. They'll respectfully challenge you, right? And (laughs) call you out. That's right. That's the best. (laughs) And I think 
setting some good good habits. It can be simple things like if you need to sleep, get an extra hour of sleep, drink another extra glass of water. I think I spend a lot of time processing and just downtime and meditation time and thinking. But I know not everybody has a luxury of that. So they have families or, or other things going on. But I think it's really important to just do that self-reflection. I like to write as well. Mm. Um, that helps me process my thoughts. Do you journal? Just yeah. curious. Do you journal? Interesting. Yeah. A lot yeah, of people. But do my, my form of journaling is just sketching a few bullets and, you know, or I might think of something like something I was really grateful for. And then a couple things that maybe I want to try that's a different approach. Sure. No, there's all types of approaches to journaling. Yeah, absolutely. Nobody says you have to, you know, write ten five diary. pages in a journal <laughs> every day. <laughs> Writing a book was hard enough. So. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Try to be really practical here. <laughs> oh wow! Well, well, thank you so much for sharing that. We always love to pull out this, see, you know, give people insights on what it takes for others to lead at the top of their game. It may or may not be right for you, but when you hear of different options, it kind of makes you think and some you may want to try and some you may not. So uh, I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. I knew you actually hit the nail on the head. Like you really have to know yourself, what energizes you and what's like depleting you and draining your energy. Yeah. And if you kind of audit and track that, then try to maximize or lean into or reach for those energizers when you are feeling depleted. Absolutely. Well, I blinked and look at the time, right? I told you we could talk for like four hours. <laughs> but, you know, before we let you go, I will, you know, we'll have all the information on how to find you, your, your website, um, your social media handles and how the links to your book, which is most important. We want all the audience members to go add that to their reading list. I mean, we'll have that in the show notes, but I want to give you a moment to give voice to where to find it as well. So would you mind sharing where our audience can find you? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Manisha Dewan. My website is empathcoaching.com. That's M-P-A-T-H, empath without the E. And yeah, just connect with me. I'd love to keep the conversation going. And where can they find your book? My book is available on Amazon. All right. The answer for everybody, Amazon. So, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Venetia, for the gift of your time and being a guest on our podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. And thank you to listeners for joining this episode. We hope to see you again next week. And you know, I only ask you one thing to, to make sure that you subscribe and share it with just one friend so that we can help others just like you to lead at the top of their game. Thank you so much and see you next week. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening to the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast, where we help you lead your seat at any employer, business, or industry in which you choose to play. You can check out the show notes, additional episodes, bonus resources, and also submit guest recommendations on our website at leadyourgamepodcast.com. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn by searching for the name Karen Rhodes with Karen being spelled K-A-R-A-N. And if you like the show, the greatest gift you can give would be to subscribe and leave a rating on your podcast platform of choice. This podcast has been a production of Shockingly Different Leadership, a global consultancy which helps organizations execute their people, talent development, and organizational effectiveness initiatives on an on-demand project or contract basis. Huge thanks to our production and editing team for a job well done. Goodbye for now.